the iconic Mrs. Folowonsho Alakija. Mrs. Alakija. Folowonsho Alakija. Mrs. Folowonsho Alakija. Mrs. Alakija. Mrs. Folowonsho Alakija. Folowonsho Alakija is a Nigerian tycoon. In the 70s, she worked her way up from secretary to banker. In the 80s, she dominated the fashion industry with her Nigerian clothing line and became a fashion icon around the world. After conquering fashion, she became the queen of the print world with a hugely successful printing company. And in the 90s, she took on the oil industry by storm and is now one of the wealthiest women in the 21st century with a net worth of over a billion dollars. Through the grace of God, with him being my helper, yes, there's no challenge that cannot be surmounted. It's God that brought me this far and I need to pay back. She consistently gives back and makes our world a better place with her incredible philanthropic work, including the Rose of Sharon Foundation, helping widows and orphans. As a businesswoman or a business person, you should use what you have to provide for those who are in need. And she has authored several inspirational books. She is one of Forbes' top 100 most powerful women in the world. And at one point, Forbes listed her as the richest black woman in the world, surpassing Oprah Winfrey. Her story is captivating and unique, and one that will inspire you. When we find out what our purpose in life is, that will determine our destiny. It's only those who work hard that can achieve their aims and their purposes. Please welcome to Woman Now at Loose Masterclass, Poloroncho Alakija. Welcome, welcome, please have a seat. So, so glad to have you. Thank you. The video gives us an amazing picture of an unbelievable story of a woman who rose to a level that the world had not seen and particularly a woman of color to reach the heights. But before we get into the amazing facts of a woman who is a billionaire, a woman who is one of two of the richest women in Nigeria, a woman who in 2004 was dubbed the richest woman in the world, surpassing even Oprah Winfrey, a woman that American women don't know anything about, a woman who grew up in a third world country that Americans have preconceived ideas about. Let's roll it all the way back from all of the Paris runways with your fashion designs and your successes and your accomplishments to your published books and your printing institutions and all of the things that you've done. I want to go all the way back to the little girl who grew up in Nigeria, and I think I've got this number right, with 52 siblings. <laughs> God of mercy. I had three, I had two siblings and I almost wanted to choke them when we were kids <laughs> growing up. How in the world, what, what did that, did you feel lost amongst 52 kids? Absolutely not. No. I was kid number eight mm -hmm. from my father, mm -hmm. kid number two from my mother, mm -hmm. and we were close family knit actually. Mm -hmm. um, everybody living in the same building, and uh, there were times later on when, you know, we dispersed into other buildings because there were so many of us. Mm -hmm. With eight wives, yes. I'm sure that's difficult to manage, but he managed. <laughs> <laughs> wow, eight wives. <laughs> Hi, honey. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have... We have in you a, a gold mine of an opportunity that I really want to maximize because not only do we have an opportunity to study your ascension into uh, the upper echelon of the world, but we also have a unique opportunity to get a deeper, richer understanding of culture, of Nigeria, the whole notion of eight wives and how that exists in Africa is something that is foreign to America. Duncan Williams was here about a couple of months ago, and I think he had 38 siblings, and, and they were just aghast at all of that. Your self-esteem does not seem to have suffered from being one of that many children, and your confidence in who you are seems to be strong 
even in that environment, was it in fact that environment and what your parents instilled in you that started the journey for you? I come from a family of traders, businessmen and women, and that helped me in my entrepreneurship skills later on in life. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from that. Mm -hmm. I was in boarding school um, initially, and then I went to England in boarding school again with a half-sister of mine, came mm -hmm. back to Nigeria, boarding school again. Um, How when, we, when, we, when we were going on holiday, I used to go and stay in my mom's store. Mm -hmm. So that opened my eyes to the deeper parts of trading. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot about merchandising, marketing, mm -hmm. customer service, uh, colors, mm -hmm. fabrics, mm -hmm. textures. I didn't know that, that was, all that was preparing me for the future. You know, I, I so relate to it. From this perspective, I had no idea growing up in the family that I was growing up in. It did not seem like a lesson. I can remember my parents going to meet with their CFO and going over their books and their accounting and, and arguing about how they were going to file taxes. And all I remember, at, at, at the time as a child, I just thought, if you all just let me out of this hot car. You know, you know I, did, I did not think that I was listening, but I was. I didn't think that I was breathing in business, but I did. I didn't think that, it wasn't like they set me down with a chalkboard and taught me, they just did it in front of me and it became a part of the way that I see the world. Do you think that the way you see the world, look, I don't want to get ahead of myself because I want them to understand that you're looking at a lady who went, went to boarding schools, uh, some of the best schools in Europe, is that right? Mm -hmm. And, and back and forth to Nigeria, and then took a job, wanted to be a lawyer. Yes. And wanted to be a lawyer. Her father wanted her to be a secretary instead. That's right. Okay? So this is a lady who wanted to be a lawyer. Her father wanted her to be a secretary. She submitted to the father because in Nigeria, the father's voice is extremely, extremely important powerful, and powerful. Yeah. The father is powerful. The role of the male, the patriarch, is extremely different from what it is in America. So she became the secretary, started working at a bank as a secretary. At what point, while you're typing letters, did you say to yourself, I'm better than this? I always knew I was better than that. <laughs> right from the start. So. But I had to obey my parents. Uh -huh. Right. Left to me, I mean, I would, have, I, I would have been a lawyer. And maybe I wouldn't be sitting here now right. if I was a lawyer. Right. The, that, see, ooh, we got so much to talk about. <laughs> we got so much to talk about. Because first of all, one of the things that I want you to get out of this is that she always knew she was better than that. There was no point along the way that she had this revelation that she was better than that. You always knew that you were better than that, yet the principles of their culture says I had to obey my father and obeying him ultimately turned into the more successful path. That's right. When you walked away from being a secretary at the bank, you walked away to do what? I walked away to go back to college in England to go and study fashion design mm -hmm. because I, I mean, I could have done it a different way. Mm. I remember one of my brothers was telling me, oh, don't resign. Why don't you just stay here? Just have some tailors making the clothes. Mm. And then you pop in there once in a while and, you know, supervise it. I said, no, I don't believe in that. Anything worth doing at all is worth doing well. I am going to resign. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to college, go and learn fashion design. I don't want anybody pulling the wool over my face in future. Mm -hmm. I want to know everything about this industry. Mm -hmm. Knowing everything about the industry is critical if you're going to run it. You can't run what you don't understand. That's right, you can't. And it is so important. Sometimes over here and perhaps around the world, people are so busy trying to get 
the position or get the desk or get the title that they don't take the time to do the research and do the homework and they end up running something that they don't fully understand. That was not the case with you. I wasn't going to stand for that. No way. Fashion is a business. It is not just looking fashionable, though you look quite fashionable Thank today. Thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> fashionable you. today. A lot of times people go for the look, but they don't go for the business. You understand that fashion is a business, and incidentally, fashion is a very hard business it is. to be successful in. What makes it even more difficult is to be a, a leading voice in fashion that is able to get your brand beyond the borders of your country. True. Able to go to the next level. How? Because there, there are people in this room who have a product that is good, that is excellent, but they can't get it out of their neighborhood, much less their country. They can't get it out of their ethnicity, much less their country. How did you break the barrier to get your brand all the way to Paris and everywhere else? Well, I thank God that uh, three weeks after I, you know, opened my fashion house. Mm -hmm. I had been invited to attend, uh, uh, to enter into a competition, a fashion competition. I, I was tired getting ready for the opening. Mm -hmm. And the opening was on Saturday, and there was this young man who walked into my store and said he was inviting me to take part in a national fashion competition. Mm -hmm. I said, whoa, slow down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. a bit much, I only just started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he said to me, you know, if, if you don't, I mean, even if you don't win, mm -hmm. I mean, you can take part next year. It's an annual event. I said, I'll take on that challenge. I don't run away from challenges. Mm -hmm. I took it on. I said, give me the form. I signed it right there. Wow. And I, three weeks later, I won that competition. Wow. <laughs> wow. And that, and that was the cup that was being transferred into my hands in, in that, that picture video. there. Yeah. Okay. You know, you know the, the funny thing? that I noticed from talking to you, we had a dinner in her honor, welcoming her to the United States uh, a, a couple of nights ago. And thank you, Jan Miller, for hosting that. Jan, would you just stand? Thank you for hosting that amazing dinner in your home. Absolutely amazing. The thing that I have noticed from both when you and I were in Accra and over here and sitting around the dinner table and talking to you, you don't run away from a challenge. No. You're not scared of a fight. No. Nope. Where did that come from? Hmm, I, it could be, it could be because I come from such a large family. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I get be. it, I, don't know. I, get, I get it. But it's something that's within me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I believe that I also got that from my mother. Mm -hmm. She was a tough cookie. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. She was a strong woman. She wasn't educated, mm -hmm. but she worked so hard, uh, by the time she was in her 60s, she had built two houses mm -hmm. from her sweat, labor, mm -hmm. nothing else. Mm -hmm. And I watched her as I was growing, the way she did everything. I, I mean, myself and my siblings on my mom's side, we learned a lot from her. Wow. Yeah. There is a saying that says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Yeah. Uh, I would not be sitting here if it were not for, for the things that I observed from my mother. And strong mothers have no idea what an impact they can have on their children by just being in the room. So all strong mothers, give it up for you. In that business, there's a lot of competition. In that, wherever there's competition, there's trickery. Wherever there's trickery, uh, there's a good old boys club. You're the new person on the block and you're a woman and you're a Nigerian and most of the competitors did not look like you. And yet you walked up there and you fought for it and you won. Take me just for a moment into the, because it is so challenging, how, do, how did you prepare yourself? Because one of the things that I'm getting at is your commitment to excellence had something to do with you winning that contest. Most people today underestimate the challenge in front of them. They go in half prepared, then they pray and ask God to bless. Huh. 
what they have not prepared to do. But you got ready for that challenge. And getting ready for the challenge, I'm guessing, means a lot of things. It means picking the right fashions. It means picking the right fabrics. It means picking the right models. It means being boss lady enough to say, you're fired, you're fired. I'll take you, not you. I'll go here and not there. Was it hard for you to be that tough in the face of the competition? Did you delegate that to somebody else? Or do you call the shots? I call the shots. Oh, yeah. I knew what I wanted. I knew that that was the goal, and I needed to put everything into it to be able to win. Mm -hmm. So I had to put in my best. Mm -hmm. And I, I had just arrived in the country, and I needed to prove my worth and break into the industry mm -hmm. and let people know that I'm here. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm yeah. here. Somebody shout, I'm here. <laughs> one of the powerful things, and many things that you're saying are very powerful, one of the powerful things is that you knew what you wanted. Most people know the money they want to make, but they don't know the quality that they wanted. She knew what she wanted. She had a vision in mind, and she rejected everything until she saw in front of her what she saw inside of her. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. See, that's an important note for you to take away with. You can't just wake up in the morning and hope it turns out right, and you don't have a clear understanding of what right is. If you don't know what right is, you won't know what wrong is, and you, won't, you will keep people that you should let go and let go of people that you should keep and, and settle for a B-grade product and won an A-grade profit margin. I understand as much as any person in business can understand what it is like to succeed and what the principles of business are like. One of the things that I think is important, I want to see do you agree with this. I found out the hard way not to put the creative in front of the business. I, that is to say, don't worry about the, to put it in, fashion language, don't worry about the fabric and the fashion if you don't have the contract and the deal and the money and the building is set up and the order is set up. So many people start being creative. They get the script, but they don't have the deal. They, 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 they have the song, but they don't have the contract. Which one did you go after first, the business or the creative? The business or the creative? The business, okay. the business part of it. Right. The business part of it. When, when you look at a deal. I had, I had, to, I had to do both okay. at the same time. At the same time. At the same time. I knew I wanted to make money. Uh -huh. I knew I wanted to let the public know that this is the way I design. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there had been fashion designers all over Nigeria all the time. Right. But I needed to make a name for myself. Mm -hmm. I needed to, to, to show that this is my creative ability. Mm -hmm. Right. To, to, to be, you know, to stand out and, uh, and, and be away from it all. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And, and just, you know, people need, needed to see what was on the inside of me. Mm -hmm. And that has to yeah. do with my creative ability. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to put yeah. all the things I'd learned in business, you know, into it to grow my business. What's the point creating all these lovely clothes and you can't make money through them? Right. You needed both. Right. You need it both. You need it both. That's important. You need them both, the, the business and the creative. Most creative people that I have run into shy away from the business, and then the business people shy away from the creativity. But one of the similarities that I'm finding is I talk to people like you or Denzel Washington or Oprah Winfrey or, P or Tyler Perry or on and on down the list of people who have done amazing things. They are just as entrenched in the business as they are in the creative parts of it. You said something to me over dinner that I told you we were gonna talk about again. And that is the story about you flying into Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, you said you flew into Birmingham at night. Tell us that story. I didn't want to waste that day, the, a working day. So I was in the office till about four o'clock before I set out to, to the airport. I was gonna fly at night to land in Birmingham, England, where I was going to attend an exhibition the fo from the following morning. If I had left Lagos in the morning, I would have spent the rest of the day flying, maybe just unpacking. Mm -hmm. Then what have I achieved? Mm -hmm. So I needed to make good use of the best part of the day in the office and get something done. 
You understand? So yes. I killed two birds with one stone, and I was still there in time to be able to sleep and wake up in time for the exhibition that was starting around 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I multitasked mm -hmm. in the process mm -hmm. and achieved everything I wanted to achieve. <laughs> However, uh -huh. by the time we landed, because we were landing around 12 a.m., we had a, a dog. Don't tell that part yet. Don't tell that part right. yet. Don't tell that part yet. <laughs> okay. I mean, we're going to tell that part just okay. a minute. Okay. Because what I want you to get before you get to this part, what struck me when you said that to me is how you value time. Oh, yes. I have never seen anybody incredibly successful who wasted time. And, and her commitment was, I don't want to waste a day. A day. Right. So I want to get all the work done during the day. I will fly into Birmingham and get there late in the night so I can get up early in the morning. I almost spoke last night. I didn't use this text, but I almost spoke about the virtuous woman. And one of the things about the virtuous woman is that she, she stayed up late at night and she rose up early in the morning. And one of the things I see about you is you're, you're willing to stay up late at night and get up early in the morning to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Right. So, she, so here comes this, this Nigerian woman on a private plane landing in Birmingham, England in the middle of the night, and what happened? So, as we were coming down the stairs, there was this dog seated neatly, gently, waiting for us to come down, okay? We stepped back a bit, we got off the plane, and we went into the lounge. For the first time, we were searched from head to toe, from hand luggage to every suitcase, and I was wondering, what, what is this? And then one of the um, uh, customs officers asked my son, who came with me with uh, my uh, factory manager and the, uh, the CEO of the company said, is Oprah Winfrey and your mother, are they friends? <laughs> <laughs> and I was wondering, these people must have Googled me before I landed. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, she's a Nigerian. Hmm. Mm -hmm. She's coming at night. Mm -hmm. hmm. And uh, she didn't fly to Heathrow or Gatswick. She flew to Birmingham. Mm -hmm. So, it's a bit quieter. Mm -hmm. When so we got back to the plane... They thought uh, you were either a drug dealer or a friend right. of Oprah. That's <laughs> right. That's right. We heard from the pilots after, you know, when we got back into the plane later on, you know, two days later, that they stripped the aircraft completely. Of course, they fell flat on their faces. What could they find? I wasn't carrying anything. Right, <laughs> right. I, I, I thought it was an interesting story and an amazing story to, to point to the fact that regardless of how much money you have, you still face harassment from preconceived ideas right. of people that you have to rise above and keep on going anyway. The notion that you're going to make a certain amount of money and not be uh, victimized by people who have preconceived ideas about you is erroneous. They thought because she was a Nigerian traveling at night into a smaller airport, uh, here is a billionaire that got strip searched all of her luggage and the plane looking for drugs, but you still rose above it and went to work the next day. That's right. Yeah, you got to go ahead. <laughs> So you have, I want to, get, want to get this in because I think our audience will find this quite fascinating. You gave your life to Christ at 40. That's right. Okay. At 40 years old, you accepted Christ. You were already rich and wealthy then. So this notion of Christianity being the poor man's religion certainly wasn't true about this woman. I don't believe so, no. Why did you give your life to Christ? You didn't need money. I was trying to get an oil exploration license. Mm -hmm. I didn't know much about Christianity. Don't forget I come from a Muslim home. Okay. Not that I practiced the religion, but I wasn't really going to church. Mm -hmm. 
my husband had said that, okay, when the children grow up, let them decide whether they want to be Muslims or whether they want to be Christians. Mm -hmm. We left it at that. And I knew that there's a God. And I wanted to find that God. Mm -hmm. I had done my very best, you know, try, in trying to search for this oil license. And it didn't seem to be, you know, I didn't seem to be get, getting any headway. Um, I picked up the Bible. And I read a part where it said that if I entered into a covenant with God, God would enter into a covenant with me. Yes. I was at the end of myself. <laughs> and it was like, okay, let me give this a try. Let's see who this God is. Wow. I entered into that covenant, uh -huh. and I said to him, if you will bless me, I'll work for you all the days of my life. Wow. You know what? That is so good. That is so good. I, will, I don't want to take away from your time, but I quickly want to tell this story. My, I never will forget one day my mother called me, and, and I picked up the phone, and I said, hello, and my mother said, Tommy? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, Jesus is God. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I was scrambling eggs this morning. And she said, I looked at the egg shell and the egg white and the egg yolk, and I saw that there were three parts, like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but it was still one egg. <laughs> And she said, Jesus is God. And it blew my mind because she got the revelation that Jesus is God from an egg. You came to Christ from a business deal. You made a business deal with God, said, I'm going into a contract with God. You keep your end and I'll keep mine. And this woman who was raised in a Muslim home not only ended up being a Christian, but she is now a preacher. This is so exciting. This is so exciting. Now, now, this is the other thing. I got to give this in because this, this, there are so many things that are fascinating about this woman. Uh, she, as you can see from the picture, she's been on the cover of Forbes. She's traveled around the world. I, I met her in Accra in Ghana during a meeting there. I had the privilege of interviewing her there. She's done just about everything from printing on down, publishing on down to ministry and evangelism. She's leaving here to go preach, I think. Are you going back home to preach or going back home to do business? We have a, a three-day crusade coming up. Three-day crusade coming up. So she's leaving here to go do a crusade and she's running a, a multi-billion dollar corporation all at the same time. So you, you have no right to be sitting up here talking about you tired. <laughs> okay, because this, this lady is on the go. But here's the thing that's really fascinating. This woman that I'm talking to now, who was typing letters as a secretary in the bank, leaped over into fashion. And I kind of get that because your mother was in textiles, you grew up around business, you understood that, and it, the fashion seems like a natural progression of where you already were, but oil? To make the leap from oil, and you're, you're trying to get into this business, you pray to God, and you say, Lord, first of all, most people would have been happy to be successful in fashion, okay? You never stop evolving and recreating yourself. But to leap from fashion, maybe you go to manufacturing, maybe you go to makeup or something like that, maybe you go to hair, you went from fashion to oil. What made you even want to go after that? I wasn't thinking about it. I had met a lot of people from all walks of life in my fashion business. Different categories of people from top to, you, you, you know. And a, a friend of mine uh, said to me that uh, she would like me to please uh, see if I could, uh, if, well, she was brokering on behalf of an American company mm -hmm. who wanted to lift crude in mm -hmm. Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And uh, she thought, okay, you know so many people. Surely you might be able to see the petroleum minister and see whether they'll be able to lift the crude. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. 
uh, I went to see my friend, Dr. Mrs., the late Dr. Mrs. Uh, Miriam Babangida, mm -hmm. and I asked her to please get, get me an appointment with the petroleum minister. Mm -hmm. um, I told her the reason, and she got me the, uh, the, the, the interview, uh, the, um, the appointment. And I saw him, I told him why I was there, and uh, he wasn't inclined towards um, giving out more uh, of Nigeria's crude mm -hmm. to, you know, multi to multinationals and what mm -hmm. have you. So he said, would they want to invest in Nigeria? Mm -hmm. I took the message back, mm -hmm. and they said they were interested in investing in Nigeria. Ordinarily, I know that with that, it, that could have been that, mm -hmm. and it right. could have ended there. Right. But I sat down and I thought about it. I've put a foot in the door. Uh -huh. Am I just going to let that door shut in my face? Yeah, 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 yeah. No. No. That's not me. Uh -huh. I don't work like that. I saw an opportunity, and I went back to my friend. I said, could you please get me another appointment? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it took time, and I got another appointment. And I went to see him. But before I went to see him, you know, we were talking about doing your homework. Mm -hmm. right. 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 All I was looking for, a small contract mm -hmm. from the oil industry, you know, just to add to what I had. So um, I went to him. I had armed myself with a few suggestions, mm -hmm. but I went there with just one with a letter, mm -hmm. you know, applying to be able to supply uh, catering services. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, oh, there are so many already doing that. Mm. Are you sure that's what you want? Um, I said, well, any small contract? He said, well, I should go and think about it. And then I went back again and I got another appointment again. Mm -hmm. All this sometimes took six months before I could get another contract, yes, Lord. But another appointment. Uh -huh. But, you know, I kept going back. Uh -huh. I offered... Uh, to uh, transport crude mm -hmm. with trucks from one area to another. He discouraged me with that as well. And he said, oh, Nigeria is going to begin to, you know, connect its pipelines and do away with the, with the, with the tankers. And oh, my heart sank again. But I wasn't going to give up. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not my style to give up. <laughs> I don't give up. <laughs> so... I went for another appointment. Everything I had offered, he had turned down. But guess what? He then opened his mouth and said, listen, the government of today actually prefers that Nigerians will take the bull by the horn and begin to get into the oil industry mm -hmm. and begin to uh, uh, explore and exploit our oil. Mm -hmm. Would you... Why don't you apply for an oil license? I said, what? Mm -hmm. Oil license? It seemed to me like when you go looking for a job and they tell you, uh, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get in touch with you. Don't call us, we'll call you. Mm -hmm. huh. So I left his office disappointed, dejected, mm -hmm discouraged, mm -hmm. depressed, all the D, negative Ds that you can think of <laughs> were, you know, formed butterflies in my tummy, in my head. Mm -hmm. And I got back home, told my husband and cried. Mm -hmm. Thank God I had a, she, yeah, I mean, there was a shoulder I could cry on. And he said, Felicia, don't worry about it. It's okay. Mm -hmm. We're comfortable. It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, I wiped my tears, woke up the next day, and I said to myself, oh no, I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to pull up my socks. Mm -hmm. I'm, not taking, I'm not taking that kind of um, uh, uh, go sit down. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not your type that we want here. Mm -hmm. Because it seemed to me like, what? I'm just a small rat. Mm -hmm. all, all I wanted was just a, you know, a contract, a small contract. Mm -hmm. And he's throwing this at me. Mm -hmm. <sighs> no. Obviously, he's trying to say, don't come back. Right. We don't need the likes of you around here. Right. But I said, no, I will take on that challenge. Yes. The people who are already in the oil industry, they don't have two heads. Right. They didn't bring it from heaven. Right. 
Whatever it takes, yes. I'm going to try my best. Yes, yes, yes. So, in preparation again, I went looking for technical partners. Mm -hmm. I found technical partners. I made my application. But guess what? I believe I had to go through three petroleum ministers mm -hmm. before anything could happen. Mm -hmm. I had to go through three years. Mm -hmm. I had to apply three times mm -hmm. because each time the petroleum minister changed, I started all over again. Yes, Lord. I yes. What you said. I said, no, I'm going to get to the end of this. I'm not going to turn back. I'm not going to let up. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to throw my arms up in the air. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Yes, yes. So, now, let me stop narrating a little bit. <laughs> there, there are several things that I want you to get out of this. She's putting together a deal that includes a lot of different partnerships that coalesce around an idea and almost like trying to open up a code to a lock, you turn it this way and it didn't open, and you turn it that way and it didn't open, and you have to turn it back that way. Sometimes you have to reconfigure the deal over and over and over and over again before it clicks and the door opens up for you. Just because you're turning it and it doesn't click doesn't mean that you can't do it. You have to reconfigure the deal. You have to change the partners. And what she is saying, she had her team around her she is now going to the government to pitch the deal, but the person in control, every time she went, it was a different person. So she had to start all the way over and come all the way up through the process again with the new person. And just before the door opens, they get moved out of office or something happens to them, and now you got a new person who doesn't know you at all, and you got to go all the way back down and start, that's what she's telling you. And through all of that, she didn't quit. When you, when you did get there, and if, if I read correctly, the, the company you ended up doing business with was Chevron, and you did this deal with Chevron, and you bought this particular piece of land, which was off the shores of Nigeria, in the middle of the water, is that right? Off the shores of Nigeria, in the middle of the water, something that, that they thought was worthless. To me, this is where divine favor comes in. Because a, a piece of land in the middle of the water could be the dumbest move you ever made in all of your life. Because you can't build apartments on it, you can't put a highway on it, you can't do anything except maybe catch fish in it. If it doesn't have oil, you're lost. What made you take the deal? I didn't think I would have anything to lose. I mean, I'm a fashion designer, right? Mm -hmm. And look at the weight of, of the one, one, one business, what kind of business mm -hmm. against the other. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you get what I mean? I get it. So, it took three years to get that license. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of threes around me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got the Father, got the Son, got the Holy yeah, Spirit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Three oil ministers, took three years, I had to apply three times, and when it eventually came, and I had actually listed quite a few oil blocks in my applications, but the one that I got ended up being the one nobody wanted. The one that nobody wanted. The one nobody wanted. Mm -hmm. But I felt, what's there to lose? Let me try. Mm -hmm. Let me see what I can do with this. Mm -hmm. And it took three years uh -huh. to get technical partners again because the first technical partner when he found that when they found out that it was deep offshore mm -hmm. they developed gold feet and mm -hmm. they said no 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 yeah, we can't too, do this too, too number far one offshore. technology had not reached that water depth it was 5,000 feet deep in water mm -hmm. how are you going to explore that it's bad enough exploring on land. Right. How much more in water? Right. And it was too expensive to explore. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as I looked at the layout of all the oil blocks and where we were, 
I mean, the most sensible thing to do is to go to your next door neighbor mm -hmm. and go and ask them first, mm -hmm. would you like to be our technical partners? Mm -hmm. I mean, since we're next door neighbors, we'll have so much in common mm -hmm. and we'll be able to reduce our expenses to explore and exploit. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, you know what? We were allocated that block some years back. Mm -hmm. We gave it back. Mm -hmm. We gave it back for this reason, that reason, that reason. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my God. So, it's looking as if this license isn't worth more than the paper it's written right, on. Right, right, right. So I said, okay, never mind. I've still got it. I'm going to go around to as many companies as I can. And it took three years before Texaco came knocking. Oh. Yes. Wow, it took three years. They themselves came knocking. They came knocking, and it took three months to negotiate. <laughs> you know, women are great negotiators. We spent three months negotiating the deal before we could sign a contract. Mm. But as soon as we signed the contract, and you That's, know, this is a good the, part. the, the, the work good started, part. the work started, in no time at all, there was an announcement by Texaco that they had struck oil in commercial quantity. It's one thing to strike oil, yeah. it's another thing to strike it in commercial quantity. <laughs> if it's not in commercial quantity, it may not be worth carrying on. Right, right, right. Because if it's too expensive and you can't make any profit from it, just forget it, yeah. just walk away. So you hit a gusher. <laughs> Pardon? You hit a gusher. Yeah. It, yeah, this, this is just shooting up out, out of the sea. The worst piece of property that nobody wanted. Nobody wanted it. Kind of sounds like the stone that the builders rejected. That's right. Became the chief cornerstone. That's, that's what I always say. Yeah. That the, 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 the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. My God, my God, my God, this, this yes. is amazing. When you hit oil and, 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 and all of this exploded, you still had to fight because then they didn't want to give you the proper share and control what the government or somebody came in. Shortly after that, the government came in. Mm -hmm. They said they were going to take. In layman's terms, 50% mm -hmm. of our 60%. Mm -hmm. Because we, we had contracted out 40% because we had 100%. We mm -hmm. had the license. Right. The license represented 100%, right? Uh -huh. But we needed technical partners, uh -huh. and we needed technical partners who could provide the money as well. We didn't have the money. So their part of the deal was 40%. So, so their part of the deal was 40%. So you got 60%. So we had 60%. Right. I'm following you. Let's go. The government came, uh -huh. took 40% from our 60, mm -hmm. came back shortly after that, took another 10%, which makes 50 out of the 60, mm -hmm. leaving us with 10%. Mm -hmm. percent. Mm -hmm. And he was like, wait a minute, how's that going to be? Mm -hmm. You can't just come and take. Mm -hmm. You have to pay compensation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their idea was, we issued the license, we own all the blocks, we gave you the license. Now, it was a sole risk. Mm -hmm. Right. Sole risk, indigenous oil block. Yeah. Meaning, if you find anything, good for you, but we'll come in. Mm -hmm. If you don't find anything, you lose all your money. You're on your own. Mm -hmm. So you go home and lick your wounds. Mm -hmm. And we had put in all our life savings mm -hmm. into this mm -hmm. because there were sums that we had to pay. Mm -hmm. The larger amounts that we couldn't afford to pay, right. when Texaco came in, mm -hmm. they paid that. Right. And then we could start working on the block. You understand? I get you. Right. So. Wait, wait one second. Right. This is what I want you to see. There's somebody in this room 
that's in a battle, a legal battle for some finances and some area in your life that you keep hitting a dead end on and you're in a fight and you're discouraged and you feel outgunned. And there's something that you ought to receive, whether it's inheritance or property or business related that's tied up and you're in a battle right now. And every time you try to make a step forward, the door keeps closing in your face. Of every seminar, this is your seminar. God sent this woman to say to you, don't give up, don't give in, fight for your stuff. Who is she? Stand up, I want to see you. This, what you need to do with this seminar is when you go back home, call a meeting reconfigure the deal, fight it another way. If you can't come up the east side, come up the west side. If you can't get up the west side, come up the north side. But God sent this woman all the way from Nigeria to tell you, you'll win if you don't quit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is why we're having this session. It's not enough to spin around and holler Jesus three times. You can get some information from people like this that renews your fight to go after your stuff or your mother's stuff or your grandfather's stuff or that property that's in rebate or is tied up in court or the paperwork's not right or the lawyer ran off with the money or the contractor didn't finish the house. Don't let that devil have your house. Get your... <laughs> Slap your sister and say, I'm taking it back. One of the things that, that people don't understand, that they really don't understand, when people see people who are as successful as you, who have your own plane and your own company and your own resources and, and, and is a billionaire and a woman and still relatively young to be a billionaire and have accomplished as much as you have, they don't think you had no struggles. They think you had it easy. They think you got it made. They, they become <laughs> haters. They think that you got it made, that you didn't go through anything. Is there warfare at the top? <laughs> there was warfare right from the beginning. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was doing 40 day fasts mm -hmm. even before I got the license. Mm -hmm. wow. Oh yeah, 40, 40 day, day fasts, fast, uh -huh. one after the other. Uh -huh. Oh yes. There's warfare. Warfare, warfare. Government Otherwise you can't, you. you can't move forward. That's why it has to be both. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't just sit there praying and wishing and saying, oh God is there, he'll do it and sit back. No uh, way. No way. No, it's not enough. You have to, <laughs> you, you have to do something. Yeah. You have to get going. Yeah. You, you, you have to get up and put everything into it. Yeah. To make it work. Yeah. Oh God, <laughs> I'm about to shout myself. Oh God, I'm going to shout myself. Faith, yeah. faith without works is dead. Dead. Oh. I had to put every, all the ingredients, I had to go into it yes. to make it work. Yes. And then after you got the license and the, the government came in mm -hmm. and they said, right, we're taking. We said, oh, hang mm -hmm. on a minute. You can't just take. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it cost us to get to this stage? Mm -hmm. You can't just come and take and walk away. No, no. Just because you're government. Right. No. So we were going to go in for a fight. Yeah. So we decided to go to court, so you, and it took 12 years. It took 12 years. 12 years. Like the woman with the issue of blood, it took 12 years. <laughs> it took 12 years. 12 we just years. heard this morning about the woman with the issue of blood. Tell somebody say it may take 12 years. But how did it end? We won. <laughs> We won. We won. There, there is so much. There's so much. I mean, I haven't even scraped the surface. There's so much. I'm out, out. I got six minutes left. I haven't even scraped the surface. We haven't even begun to talk about the things that we can talk about. There's so much for us to learn, uh, particularly African Americans. 
that we could learn not only from the business I come in and, and, and an awareness of things about our culture, uh, an awareness about Africa in general, awareness about things that you might take for granted are absolutely amazing to us. We, we, we have to get you back to talk about some more stuff. So how many people have enjoyed her so far? If you enjoyed her show or you enjoyed her. Now, Mrs. Alakija, I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute. This is what I want. Every woman in here who's got guts, who's got big, ridiculous, crazy dreams, <laughs> who may be in a fight, a legal fight, a battle for what is rightfully yours, every woman in here who's going after a big deal and it looks like the odds are against you. See, there are levels. The Bible says God take you from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Everybody doesn't need this kind of glory because that's not their story. But there are, there are few women in this room that are in a big fight that it feels like you're over your head and the odds are all against you. And you came to this conference and just expecting something. I want Mrs. Alakija to pray for those women who are going to have to fight to get what's rightfully yours. I don't have time for you to go into a trance. I want you to run down here for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for her to just, just pray. Just stay right there. Just pray over something that you're trying to land, that when you get back home, you expect something to happen in your life, and you're willing to fight for it. It's going to take as long as it takes. You may have to reconfigure the deal. You may have to go back to square one zero to get the breakthrough that you're going to get, but you mean business. There are certain levels. I want you to get this good. Now, all of us want to be blessed, but this is not for everybody. There are certain levels that only certain types of people can pray for you for. If, if you're fighting devils in a trailer, you can't help me fight devils in a penthouse. You need somebody on the level of the fight you're going through to decree and declare what is rightfully yours. Am I right about it? I'm, now, I, I've been talking to the businesswoman. I've been talking to the businesswoman, the businesswoman, Mrs. Alakija. Now I'm going to talk to the preacher woman, Mrs. Alakija. I want you to stand up and declare a word over these women. It's the difference between somebody praying for you from, from Starbucks. And it's another difference from somebody with a billionaire anointing. See, I don't have that. I'm good for a meal or two, but this is somebody with a woman like you with a billionaire anointing who fought for a breakthrough. If you're streaming online, you need to line yourself up with this opportunity. Whatever God says to you to say or do, just do that. In Jesus' name, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I just thank you for giving your children a name and a place in the land of the living. I thank you for their lives. I thank you for watching over them. I thank you for being with them on a daily basis. I thank you for going in and out with them. I thank you, Father, Lord God, because they look up to you. They don't look unto others, Father, Lord God, because you are the Alpha and you are the Omega, and they see you in their lives. Father, Lord God, I thank you for that which you have done for me, for my family. I thank you, Father, for how far you have brought me. I thank you, Father, Lord God, for all you have done in me, with me, and through me. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to bless your children today. If you're the one who has blessed me, if you're the one who has brought me this far, if you're the one who has get, gone ahead of me and made every crooked path straight, if you're the one who has helped me in all the battles that you have helped me to fight and win, Father, Lord God, all these ones that have come out now, Father, Lord God, they're waiting for you to help them in their battles. Father, let them win those battles in the name of Jesus. 
Whatever kind of battle that they're fighting, Father, you know, Lord, as their faces differ, so their needs differ. So their battles are all different. Father, Lord God, step into their boat. Father, step into their boat. I say step in their, their boat. Make a way for them, O oh Lord God. Let peace be still in their lives, in their situations, in their businesses, in those contracts, whatever it is that they're seeking your face for. Father, Lord God, descend in your might and in your power and in your glory and do a new thing in their lives. Do that which only you can do. Do that which only you do best. Put a new step in their dance. Put a new dance in their step. Make a way for your children, O Lord God. Let them be winners. Don't let, let them be losers. Yes, let Lord. them be victors. Yes, Don't Lord. let them be victims. In the name of Jesus, that which you have started, Father, complete it for them, O oh Lord God. Father, make them win in every area of their lives. Yes, whatever Lord. it is that they're battling, that they're struggling with, Father, make a way for them. Put testimonies in their mouths. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, you are the one who has lifted me up. Lift up your children. You are the one who has blessed me. Bless your children. You are the one who has prospered the work of my hands. Prosper the work of their hands. Father, Lord God, envelop them in your bosom, O oh Lord God. Draw them closer to yourself. Make a way for them where there seems to be no way. Do a new thing in their lives. Father, glorify yourself. Do a new thing, O oh Lord God. Make a way for them, O oh Lord God. Put testimonies in their mouths, O oh Lord God. Glorify yourself. Put the enemy to shame. Edify your children, now and forevermore. Father, if you are the one who made me this billionaire, there will be many more billionaires amongst them. In the name of Jesus. Billionaires, trillionaires, you are the one who made a way for me. Make a way for your children. In the name of Jesus. Remove the struggles, O oh Lord God. Remove the tears, O oh Lord God. Father, do a new thing in their lives. Glorify yourself, Father, now and forevermore. For in Jesus' mighty name we are praying. Amen. And the people said, Amen. And the people said, Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we are praying. Yes. Amen. Give yes. the Lord a clap of me. Yes. A clap of yes. A mighty clap of Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Thank you for hearing us. Yes. Thank you, Father, Lord God. Yes. Thank you, Lord. If you Spirit. receive it, you Thank ought to just you, stop Lord Lord. and praise God Thank right you, where you are. Thank right you, Right where Father. you are. Right where Your you are. Your children will testify. Right where you are. They will come back and testify. Right where you are. They the will come back and testify. Is on you in right Jesus where you name. are. If you Amen. receive it. If you receive it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Glory bless to God. God bless you. God bless you. Look her up, Google her, get her books, get her materials. Mrs. Alakaja, Fallon Rosha Alakaja. How'd that do? I did good with it. You were amazing. Thank you so much. You were absolutely amazing. I'm so proud and so honored to have you here. I want you to give it up for Mrs. Fallon Rosha Alakaja. Yes. Yes. Touch everybody you can reach and tell them I got the billionaire anointing on there. Yeah, yeah.